Names like Bob Marley, Junior Marvin, and the Whalers changed the course of Jamaican music and brought the reggae sound to the world stage. Today, reggae's greatest lead guitarist, the one and only Junior Marvin, is here. So get up, stand up, because our special musical edition of Washington Full Circle starts right now. And welcome to Washington Full Circle. I'm Furman Patterson. Jamaican-born guitarist Junior Marvin's first album with Bob Marley and the Whalers called Exodus was such a game changer in the world of reggae, it was voted best album of the 20th century by Time Magazine. Today, Junior Marvin and the Whalers are reggae royalty. Thanks so much for joining us, sir. Hey, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, everybody's <laughs> been talking for weeks about your coming, so we're, we're, we're extremely happy. Okay, so <laughs> that's some goodies waiting for me then, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, you do, you do. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, I, I hear that you've been, you know, filling uh, concert venues all around town, all around the world. You know, how do you do that? A lot of hard work, a lot of rehearsals. You know, um, I always say to young musicians, rehearsal is a key. And I learned from people like Stevie Wonder, from Prince, Jimi Hendrix, Bob Marley. And they all work really hard. You know, behind the scenes, you think they're just natural talent. But it's talent and a lot of hard work and focus and balance. And just, you know, try to stay motivated and uh, do what you're supposed to do. Work hard and, you know, eventually it pays off. Now, um I called you a uh, ledge royalty, um, Jamaican <laughs> <Not quite. laughs> reggae royalty. And it's because I think uh, you're traveling as, uh, touring as uh, Junior Marvin, as Whalers. Right. That Whalers name has been around for forever, but it's still, you're still drawing the crowds. What is it about that sound, the Whalers sound, that you think draws people? Well, I think Bob Marley was like a workaholic. I don't think, in fact, I know, because <laughs> he worked me pretty hard. <laughs> but I, you know, it, I enjoyed it and it had a lot of um, positive ends to it. And uh, he always tried to get better and better and perfect his sound. And the soul of the music was very important mm -hmm. because when I joined the Whalers, you know, I was known around London as the young Jimi Hendrix, which was a big, like, you know, I'm nowhere near Jimi Hendrix, <laughs> believe me. But people used to call me that because of my style. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the Whalers and I Figured I pretty much worked out all the songs. And then one day Bob put me one side and says, hey, you know, I know you think you're a hot <laughs> shot, but you know, you gotta feel this music. It's not just playing the right notes. And it took me to another dimension, you know, of okay, let me go back and start from the beginning again. Mm -hmm. And I got together with the bass player and the drummer, and then I realized that it was a lot of thought into the feeling. There's always a space where you don't play. And if you cover that space, you lose the feeling, you lose the soul. You know, every music has soul, whether it's Spanish music, you know, you see the Spanish dancers and you know, flamenco, and right. it has a soul. Mm -hmm. And Brazilian music, and so does reggae, and so does classical, and so does jazz, you know. There's a soul in every type of music. And you have to really not just learn the songs, but learn it and then go back and start again and get the soul of it. And then you go to that level like Stevie Wonder or Marvin Gaye or, you know. then, uh, Talking about Stevie Wonder, uh, I understand there was a time when both Stevie Wonder and Bob Marley wanted you and you had to decide between Tell which one you were going to join up. How did that happen? Well, I was in London, you know, doing a lot of session work and I met Chris Blackwell who was the CEO of Island Records. And they had people like U2, Cat Stevens, Bob Marley, and many other famous bands. And so he had a lot of session work. And I lived around the corner from the studio. And we got familiar. And uh, Bob Marley was in Jamaica. And he did a concert for the people, which was called Smile Jamaica. And it got very political. And they tried to shoot the band. And so Bob had to literally exit shoot us. the band. Yeah, I mean, re literally try to kill them because of politics. And, Politics is a little bit heated up in Jamaica back then. It's a lot more cooler now. But, um, you know, Bob had to exodus Jamaica and came to England. And he came without a guitarist. And I'd never met him before, but I loved his music. 
especially a song called Concrete Jungle that mm -hmm. had a really great rock guitar in there, a lot of blues overtones. And uh, I had a friend who played guitar for Stevie Wonder. And he was a guitarist for Minnie Ripperton as well. And his wife was expecting a baby, and he recommended me to Stevie Wonder. I said, you know, Junior's in England. I've worked on his solo album, and he could fill in for me while, you know, I'm with my wife going through this pregnancy. And so I got a phone call on Valentine's Day <laughs> from Stevie Wonder, and I thought it was a joke. You know, I thought somebody was playing a joke on me. You know? Sounded like Stevie. Yeah, it sounded <laughs> like Stevie, but you know, could could have been somebody just pranking me on Valentine's Day, and. Uh, I said, is that really Stevie Wonder, you know? And I was like, oh, no, come on, who is this, you know? He said, no, no, I got your number from, you know, this very good friend of yours who played on your album and recommended you because of his predicament with his wife and the baby coming. And so, okay, I believed him after a while, you know? I said, okay, Stevie, I'm your greatest fan ever, you know? <laughs> so, well, I'd like you to come and work with me, you know, my Black Bull Music Company and sign a 10-year contract. And I'm going, wow, you know, I'm like getting goosebumps and like, so are you, are you, you serious? Really good. Yeah. You know, and um, kind of caught me off guard, you know. And I, I had a, an appointment for that same afternoon with Chris Blackwell. He called me the day before and said, I want to take you somewhere, bring your guitar with you. And I thought, Valentine's Day, I've got to be with my girlfriend. Come on, you know, <laughs> I'm not doing any sessions for you. He said, no, 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 I just want you to meet someone and you can still meet your girlfriend later. I said, okay. So I'm on the phone with Stevie, knock on the door. You know, it's Chris Blackwell outside in his Rolls Royce, you know, white Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> so course. something special was going on, you know. So I said to Stevie, you know, I had a previous appointment and I'm really honored that you invited me to come and play with you and I'm just blown away. And could I have a couple hours to think about it and get back to you? So he gave me his number and um, I went out with Blackwell and jumped in the Rolls Royce, and I didn't say anything, because I was in shock. <laughs> I was just like, he said, what's wrong with you? I go, nothing, <laughs> I'm fine, <laughs> you know, I'm just thinking. <laughs> he said, okay, well, I want you to come and meet someone, and uh, it might be very interesting for you. I said, okay. I said, is it a session? Because I don't really want to do a session on Valentine's Day, although it's a beautiful day to do a session, but. And you've got a date. <laughs> you know, I've got a date, you know. So he said, no, it won't take too long. So we went to a very fashionable part of London called Chelsea. It's very famous for fashion and high tech and mm -hmm. clothes and, you know, the cool people. And we went to this house that had seven stories, real colonial house, you know, and each house had, each uh, floor had an apartment. And we walked in the front door and there was this man in front of the mirror, but I could only see his back. And he had big dreadlocks, you know, like, and he had a big aura around him from the back. And I'm thinking, I wonder who that is. It's got to be Bob Marley, you know. <laughs> Nobody could have a big aura like that except for Bob Marley. And he turned around and it was Bob Marley. And he had this big grin on his face. And he slapped five with me and said, welcome to the Whalers. <laughs> I said, welcome to the what? <laughs> oh, by the way, my name is Junior. <laughs> he goes, oh, we know about you, you know. We got you down. We've already done the research. Yeah, we've done the research <laughs> on you. You know, we would love for you to come and play with the Whalers. And I said to myself, Am I dreaming today? Is this a dream? So I started pinching myself, you know, and I'm getting goosebumps and I'm pinching myself. Oh, that hurts. It is real, <laughs> you know. So I'm thinking, did I just get a phone call from Stevie Wonder? And now Bob Marley's asking me to come and play with the Whalers. So I'm thinking, oh, it's just a session, right? He goes, no, 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 you know, we want you to join a band. Our, our guitar player by the name was Donald Kingsley. He's uh -huh. from the blues family in Chicago. Um, you know, because of the shooting incident, he jumped on the first plane home and nobody knew where he disappeared, you know. <laughs> he just got out of there. Right, and so Bob needed a guitar player and he was working on Exodus, the album. And he said, well, you know, did you bring your guitar with you? I said, yeah, I always travel with my guitar. Well, let's jam a couple of songs, you know, and he's speaking in Patois. And of course, my parents are Jamaican, so, mm -hmm. you know, I know Patois very well. And he said, yeah, man, come sit down and play two tune, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, Rastafari, you know? So I'm going, yeah, this is cool. So then another musician from the band came along, and I thought it was a bass player. And yeah. he was yeah. pretty tall, yeah. you know? And he was, had this bass in his hand and said, oh, my name is Tyrone. And I thought he was a bass player, because I weren't really familiar with the, the names of all the individual musicians in the band. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was playing bass. But in fact, he was really the keyboard player. 
but he's a very good guitarist and bass player. So he started playing the bass and Bob was playing acoustic rhythm and I plugged my electric guitar in a little amplifier and we played for about two and a half hours. We played three songs. Each song was about 45 minutes long. <laughs> <laughs> and did, did you know at that time, was your mind pretty much made up at that time? No, that you, I was uh, just jamming, you know. I was just, I didn't even have any idea that I was going to accept Bob's offer or if he was serious. I thought he was joking. Well, if we can leave a cliffhanger right there. <laughs> More to talk about. Don't go away. We'll be right back with one of the legends of reggae, Junior Marvin, as he stirs it up for love. Stay right where you are for more of our special musical edition of Washington Full Circle. Welcome back to Washington Full Circle. This man right here is part of one of the most famous reggae groups in music history. And today, singer-guitarist Junior Marvin is still stirring it up all around the world. Now, before we start with the singing and stirring yeah. it up, we just want to finish that Stevie uh, Wonder song. You're deciding between who you want to go with. Well, I couldn't make up my mind, so I called my parents and all of my school friends, and they said, listen, you're Jamaican, Bob Marley's Jamaican, you got to go with the Jamaican <laughs> brother. So that's how I made the decision. And uh, I still love Stevie Wonder. Was well, Stevie disappointed? <laughs> uh, no, actually, he knew Bob Marley. They were good friends, and they were writing songs like Boogie on Reggae Woman and Master Blaster. And so he said, listen, try it out with Bob. If he doesn't work, give me a call. So the door was open. And What more can you ask? What more for, can right? you ask? Well, stir it up. Thank you so much. Take it away. Yes, I want everyone to join in, sing along. Don't be shy now. This is called Stir It Up. Come on now. Everybody get up. Enjoy yourself. We're going to stir it up. Stir it up. Darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. It's been a long, long time since I've got you on my mind. Just me and you, come on and steer it up. Everybody sing. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Ooh, wee. Ooh, little darling, steer it up. Now I'm going to sing you another verse. You sing along too. I'll push the wood up. Blaze your fire, said I'd satisfy your heart's desire, said I'd stir it, yeah, every little minute, all you got to do is keep within it, say, steer it up, come on kids, little darling, steer it up, clap your hands. Come on and steer it up, woo 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 me. Ooh, little darling, steer it up. Got one more verse for you. Are you ready? Here we go. Quench me when I'm thirsty. Won't you cool me down when I'm hot? Your recipe, my darling. It's so tasty And you sure Can steer your pot So steer it up Clap your hands 
Little darling, steer it up. Come on, come on, come on, come on, steer it up. Woo, 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 wee. Ooh, little darling, steer it up. I want you all to steer it together. Can you do that? Say, steer it, steer it, steer it together. Louder, louder. Steer it, steer it, steer it together. Yeah. Steer it, steer it, steer it together. One more time. Steer it, steer it, steer it together. Yeah, 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 yeah. Steer it up. Now we're doing it. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Woo, 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 wee. Ooh, little darling, steer it up. One more time. Everybody, clap your hands. Steer it up. Little darling, steer it up. Come on, baby. Come on and steer it up. Woo, 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 wee. Little darling, steer it up. Thank you. Yeah. One love. And welcome back to Washington Full Circle and our guest, reggae legend Junior Marvin. Uh, that was fantastic performance. You, you, you're always <laughs> stirring it up, got the crew all stirred up. But uh, I just want to go back to the, the earlier part. Right. Um, you went to, to London as, as a nine-year-old, is that yes, it, from correct. Jamaica to London? Yes. Uh, what was that like arriving uh, at such a young age in this uh, major well, it was, city? Well, it was like an adventure, you know. Um, you know the UK was the mother country for most of the Caribbean and, and, of course, the British Commonwealth. And so we were always told, yeah, you know, that's where you got to go. It wasn't America then. Now it's America. But, you know, people want to, young kids want to come to America and go to school or college or whatever. But back then it was the UK. And my mother went there to study um, clothes designing. And uh, I stayed with my grandmother, myself and my sister. And my, my mother was able to get a good job and save up enough money, she sent for myself and my sister. And uh, it was like an adventure, you know. <laughs> I heard about snow, I heard <laughs> about fog, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, but musically, uh, you were studying piano at an early right. age. Right, my yeah. aunt, who was the, uh, like the, the elder of the family, was a Garveyite. She was a follower of Marcus Garvey. And so she tried to instill a lot of discipline in every member of the family. And one of the disciplines was to learn how to play the piano. And she was a piano professor herself. She taught a lot of people. And so all my cousins and myself and my sister, we all were plonked on the piano from age two. <laughs> of course, we didn't like it. You know, we tried to run away. And, but it was very good discipline. And she had one of those canes, you know, those long canes with a hook on the end. And every time we hit a wrong note, she would come down, whack. <laughs> so we were scared of her, you know, and like, oh, my God, I, now I got to play the piano again. I'm oh. looking at her. And, of course, we had to learn how to read. And yeah. we would memorize the pieces, and she would catch us, go, okay, where are you? And go, uh, one <laughs> cane okay, would come out, you know. But yeah. later on, we, we discovered how beneficial it was for our education, you know. Yeah. I mean, when you learn to read, you learn mathematics, you learn timing. You learn how to articulate with sound, you know, loud, soft, right. you know, you learn all the uh, jargon. But, but seeing someone, seeing some performer change you from an interest in the piano to the guitar, uh, what was the catalyst for that? Well, when I went to England, um, a school friend of mine uh, told me that we could get more girls <laughs> if, we, if, we went out, the girls. if we went out and bought guitars, you know, not even play them, just buy the guitar. And then I saw Elvis on TV doing Jailhouse Rock. And I thought, that's me. I want to be Elvis, you know. And so um, 
we went out and I bought a really bright red, cherry red guitar and I'd look at it every day. I wouldn't even play it I'd, or try to play it. I'd just look at it because it looked so good, you know. And then later on, I, I had the privilege to meet Jimi Hendrix and I shook his hand and he was so shy. I could not believe it. Jimi Hendrix? Really? Yeah, he was so shy, you know, it was just, hello, you know, <laughs> wouldn't even look at you. But on stage, he was like phenomenal. And um, he really influenced me to go and study the guitar right. and mm -hmm. learn a lot, you know, from him. Right. And I was also very privileged to play with T-Bone Walker, who wrote Stormy Monday Blues. I met George Benson. My father was a jazz piano player. So I had all the records with all the great guitar players, you know, B.B. King, Albert King, Freddie King. Yeah you know, Wes Montgomery, and of course there was also John Coltrane, Charlie Parker, you know, well, Aretha Franklin, you know, <laughs> every, you know, and I was very lucky that my family was so much into music and I absorbed it like a sponge, you know, mm -hmm. not only pop music and reggae music, but also jazz and classical music, and of course gospel, because my aunt who got us started uh, they had their own church in Jamaica. Yeah. So we went to church eight days a week, you know, <laughs> once every day and twice on Sunday. <laughs> now, I, I, I did hear that you also was in the, the Beatles film. There was a film on the Beatles, I think it was called Help. Right. How did you end up in a Beatles well, film? Well, when my sister and I went to London, my sister was like um, six years old and I was almost 10, I was nine. And my mother's hairdresser was an agent. She worked as an agent part-time getting young kids to perform in TV shows and commercials, in plays, in, you know, in the, what we call the West End, which you guys call Broadway. And so um, I auditioned for a lot of Broadway you know, in London, which was called the West End, of course. Right. And I was very fortunate to get a lot of work as an actor. Um, I did television with um, uh, Roger Moore in The Saint and Patrick McGoon. James Bond. <laughs> yeah, and um, so, and then I did commercials, yeah. you know, and I was also in a musical called Hair, and I auditioned um, to do a scene in Help where the local police in the Bahamas were ch was chasing Ringo on the beach. Yeah. He did something wrong and they were running after him, and you know, the Beatles are really remember, short guys. I remember that scene. They're very short, yeah. and I was only about 12 or 13, but I was tall for my age at that time. Yeah. And so they dressed me up as a policeman and chased him Ringo. <laughs> and to do that scene took about three days, you know. Right. And the rest, the rest <laughs> yeah. is history. And, and the funny thing was they shot the scene in the Bahamas and it wasn't quite right. So they simulated one of the studios in London to look like a beach. And that was where I did my filming. I wasn't actually in the Bahamas at all. Fantastic. I wish I was. But <laughs> It was all done in London, and it was great. And I yeah. get to meet them, and they were so funny, and yeah. they were great songwriters, and you know, it was awesome to meet those guys. Well, today we got to meet you, and we got to hear some fantastic music. Uh, appreciate your stopping by. My pleasure. You're always welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. God bless you guys. That's it for this special musical edition of Washington Full Circle. Thanks to our guest, Junior Marvin, and to you for watching. We'll see you again next time. One love.